I'm glad this isn't billed as a debate because I can't think of a lot in that that I'd really want to disagree with. Um, I'd like to come at this from a completely different angle, um, which may or may not you know, be complementary to what Simon's just said in some ways. Um, I went back to the original campaign article that this was based on to try and get my head around what this was all about. And this, this is what it looked like online. Um, and I reread it a few times and I puzzled over what I was going to say about it. And finally, it sort of dawned on me that there's something quite important in it that was, in what seems to be the current phrase, hidden in plain view. Uh, and that key word seems to me to be status, which actually is there, obviously, in the headline, and then appears several times in the article. But nobody seemed to be really commenting on why status was such an important thing or why a discussion of the planner's role and skills was being viewed through this particular lens. So what I want to do in the next 20 minutes is just notice this and reflect on it a little. And I'd be interested to see if it leads us into anywhere new, if there's time for discussion. Because um, this article seems to be all about status, about hierarchy, rank, or place, if you like. And I think it's playing out in two contexts that are <coughs> distinct and yet get muddled up with each other as well. The first of these status issues is about the position of the uh, planner within the ad agency. And the other is about the place or rank of the ad agency relative to the client organisation. And the way these connect with each other seems to go something like this implicitly. If the planner can, quotes, get into the boardroom, that will achieve two things. Firstly, it will up the position of the agency relative to the client. And it will then up the rank of the planner in the agency because they will be succeeding in this task where the others implicitly are failing, the creatives and the account directors. And if you read the article, that's very clear. Now, the thesis of the campaign article, with this one notable dissenter who said, keep all planners out of the boardroom at all costs, is that planners are generally succeeding in doing this, that they're getting better at what they do, and the sign of that is that they're earning the respect of clients at a senior level. I don't know if I have the evidence whether I agree with that or not. Um, I wouldn't deny it, certainly. I think there are some fantastic planners around today, obviously. It would be nice to think, indeed, that the standard of planning increases, improves from one generation to the next, just as the runners seem to get faster from one Olympics to the next. Planners today do, after all, have the shoulders of giants to stand on. They have the benefit of all kinds of technology and scientific understanding that simply wasn't there 40 years ago. So I'm prepared to believe that today's planners at their best may still be raising the bar, but I'd also like to suggest that quality is never one-dimensional and that generalisations like that will always hide a far more complex picture. And in particular, I wouldn't like a narrative of continual improvement to underestimate the quality of some of the things that were done in the past. And at that point in my train of thought, I began to notice that there's actually a third uh, quite interesting implicit status contest within this discourse, if you read it again, which is the status of today's planners versus their predecessors. Um, at this point, uh, as it's been a bit dry so far, I thought I'd liven it up by showing you a picture of what planners used to look like in the old days. Um, <laughs> this is a group of planners from BMP, uh, pictured at Lingfield races in about 1978 and rather uh, unexpectedly the one in the stripy blazer with the cigarette is me. Um, so you can draw your own conclusions from that. Anyway, what I'd like to do tonight is just talk a bit about particularly the first two of these status battles about 
the planner in the agency, the agency relative to the client, and a little bit about the present versus the past. They're all very interesting to me. Um, I mean, they're interesting uh, partly because one thing that Tracy didn't mention in her nice biography of me is that most recently I've been doing a master's degree at Ashridge in organizational change. So a lot of my thinking now tends to be colored by looking at what's going on in an organization? What are the relationships uh, between the people? And what's the culture? What, what's driving this? So I guess I'm seeing it slightly through that lens. But I think there's a practical point to this as well, which is to consider how far are these status issues useful things to be bothering about? And is there a point at which they might become actively unhelpful for any of you in doing your job? So let's talk first of all about the planner in the agency. Well, the invention of account planning um, was about a number of things, but one of them was certainly about power and status. Both at J. Walter Thompson and at Pritchard Wood, later BMP in the 60s, a key part of the intention in founding account planning was to take the research departments that were marginalised and then to empower them by putting them at the heart of the agency. Jeremy Tunstall wrote a book about London advertising agencies in 1964 in which he said that the status of research executives is correspondingly low. Typically, they're paid less than account executives and copywriters. Market researchers <coughs> languish on the sidelines of advertising. They complain of not meeting clients, not being invited to background meetings, not being properly briefed. They also say that when their research has been done, it is often completely ignored. Around the year 2000, Christopher Hackley, who is one of the very few academics who studied the sociology of ad agencies in a systematic way, made a set of observations of agencies in London and New York concerning how planners experience their relations with other departments. He wrote, the word hate occurred more than once in interviews with planners in connection with their standing in the agency. Some planners felt that daily working life was a running battle with account executives who excluded the planner from strategic decisions and referred to them for trivial questions. Words worrying rem worryingly reminiscent of Jeremy Tunstall's observations about agency researchers 35 years previously. Um, and you will all know better than I do whether there's any truth in those words in your agency today. In the culture of the ad agency, it's generally taken for granted that account directors and creatives are essential, axiomatic, while the parvenu planning department continually has to justify its existence. You need creative media and account people, but if the planners are no good, they just wither and die. The planner needs to show his value constantly in order to survive. Interestingly, since then, we've all discovered that agencies actually didn't need media people or at least media people didn't need agencies. But I suspect this fundamental assumption about the other departments still remains very pervasive. And rather obviously, I think it's always been the underlying mission and purpose of the account planning group to justify the existence of planning. At which point we might ask ourselves, how does this sense of a need to justi justify itself, this healthy paranoia, as it's called in the article. How does this serve account planning? Well, in one way, of course, it can be a very positive, very healthy thing. Um, you know, it's a challenge that keeps the planners on their toes, continually asking how and where they're adding value. And you might wish that the creatives of the suits habitually did a bit more of that themselves. But I think there's quite a shadow side to it as well. It throws an undue emphasis onto what planners do that can be isolated, whereas much of the most important work is done as part of a team. For a long time, when I was a planner, I had a screensaver that scrolled a quote from this guy, Jean Monnet, the founder of the European Union. You can change the world as long as you don't expect to take the credit for it. I still think this is true, and I think it's especially true of account planning. And the paranoia also privileges the tangible and the intellectual parts of the planner's output, the written briefs, the PowerPoint slides, the strategy documents, 
and perhaps worst of all, the bloody insights, while it risks devaluing the unstructured conversations, the hints, the body language, the personal and emotional relationships, which are actually essential to fulfilling this role effectively. Now, the IPA Awards and the APG Awards have added a lot to our shared knowledge, but their limitation is that they're always written to prove a point, which most obviously in the case of the APG Awards is look how clever the planner was. Meanwhile, there's a real shortage of case studies that give any flavour of the real complex responsive processes, the muddle and confusion and sheer luck from which most great campaigns emerge. I want to talk now also about the status relationship between the agency and the client. I think this is an incredibly interesting area on which not a lot of research has been done and it may even be something that I explore in the doctoral doctorate that I'm thinking about doing over the next few years. Let me give you this quote in this conclusion to his 1958 book, Madison Avenue, USA, which is still, in my view, the best single book ever written about advertising. Martin Mayer wrote this. The most interesting cultural phenomenon created by advertising is the advertising community itself, with its strange blend of assertion and obedience prosperity and insecurity, flamboyance and timidity. In the agencies especially, at the heart of advertising, endless confusions of purpose, functions, organisation and status create a nervous, overworked and overestimated internal society. At the root of it all lies the problem of professional standing. Now that sentence predates account planning. In fact, it even predates the years in which Mad Men is supposed to be set, yet I continue even today to recognise so much of it in the many conversations I have with people in advertising agencies. And maybe there's a little less prosperity and a little less flamboyance now, though not voluntarily, but the rest of it still feels spot on to me. And I wonder how many of you here can relate, if you're honest, to being part of a nervous, overworked and overestimated internal society. Well, all these ambiguities are played out daily in ad agencies' relations with their clients as the self-image of creative freedom and superiority continually grinds up against the inexorable client demands for order, rationality and obedience. At best, of course, agency people find ways to transcend this as they have always done and they achieve some kind of working relationship based on mutual respect. But the default situation, the endemic pattern, is still very much as Mayer describes it. And it's in this context that agencies, I think, have always dreamt of getting into the boardroom or moving up the food chain and that they curse the consultants who are always eating their lunch. And one recurring fantasy like that of John Treasure is that the agency will become more scientific, more professional, more like McKinsey, or perhaps more modestly like Millwood Brown, at the same time, perhaps because they know deep down that these are the last things they want to be like, agencies do absolutely nothing to change their culture or strategy in order to emulate these models. They don't spend on training, they don't invest in R&D or original learning, and they don't reward any challenges to the status quo. My old boss, Keith Reinhardt, used to challenge everyone he met to name a professional organisation that had changed less in the past 40 years than the advertising agency. He claimed nobody had yet identified one. <laughs> the smart agency is the one that recognises that this fantasy about getting into the boardroom is really just that. It's a fantasy. It's a daydream that provides some psychological compensation for the daily experience of powerlessness that is endemic in every agency. Whether you get into the boardroom or not, and whatever we mean by that, but I assume it means some kind of relationship with the highest levels of management, that is not, after all, under the agency's control. It depends on all sorts of factors, including the relationship the agency has with its actual clients and with those people's relationship with the rest of their organisation. And it depends ultimately on the nature of the task and on what the agency can contribute or is expected to contribute to it. Setting up a goal that says boardroom equals success and anything else equals exclusion and failure can only interfere with seeing this clearly and responding to it. I've recently spent some time uh, thinking about 
how consultants work, studying what's been written about this, partly because I aspire to work now as a consultant myself. And I've come across certain key principles that I wish I'd known earlier in my career, because ad agencies might do well sometimes to think about themselves as consultants, not in the sense that they aspire to smarter suits and giving more presentations to the board, but in terms of how they envisage and contract for the relationships that they have with their clients. It's Peter Block, who many might consider the guru of consulting, identifies three basic models of consultancy. The expert, the pair of hands, and the collaborator. Well, they're all valid ways of working, um, and in practice, any relationship might contain elements of more than one. But I think it's important to be clear about what you want as a consultant and what your client expects of you. Well, the expert is a popular model. Um, it's even the default model in many situations. A manager brings in a consultant to use their expert knowledge. They offer the problem, the consultant offers a solution. In many situations it works fine. My central heating is broken, I bring in the expert, my heating engineer, he fixes it. Job done. The pair of hands is also popular. Uh, you bring in a consultant just to provide extra resources, project planning, implementing a training course, whatever. You tell them what to do and they do it. Job done. But there are many situations where neither of these will work so well because both those models depend on the client having a very accurate idea of what the problem or the need really is. The expert model also depends on the client being prepared to implement the recommendations of the expert or allow the expert to implement them. But in many cases, the real need for a consultant at all is to help the client redefine the problem or need. And there may be all sorts of reasons why clients persistently fail to act on the recommendations that a consultant makes. The expert appears to have a kind of power here that the pair of hands doesn't. But the power still lies, essentially, with the client. And keeping the consultant in the expert role can be a very effective way of actually enabling the client to avoid taking the really difficult decisions that they might need to make. I mean, one very common ploy is for the client to say to the expert, can you prove to me that what you recommend will work? And now, after that question's been asked more than a couple of times, it usually means that no amount of reassurance or proof will be enough to overcome the client's resistance. It becomes a sophisticated version of Eric Byrne's classic game, Why Don't You? Yes, But, which fulfills a similar role in preventing change taking place. And I think there may be many people in ad agencies, especially the planners, who recognise that situation. I think the third way, collaboration, is generally essential if you're talking about real change taking place. And I think the same applies when you're talking about any kind of creative process. It requires both sides to assume that they can come up with a better solution if they work together than either could if they were working independently. I'm not sure I particularly want to use the word partner, which some agencies are quite fond of, um, because one party still remains the client, the other is at their service, and it's equally important that each remembers their role and responsibility in that relationship. But what is essential is that a dialogue takes place and that each side resists the temptation to close that dialogue down. Block stresses the importance of establishing this kind of relationship right from the first contact. Apparently trivial details like repeatedly cancelling the meeting or demanding written proposals establish power relationships at the outset, which can then be taken for granted by both sides and become very hard to break. Block says the consultant can be tempted to start working bent over in order to get the job, telling himself they can always stand up later. But generally, that's not possible. My suggestion is that historically and today, ad agencies have almost invariably contracted implicitly as either the expert or the pair of hands or something between the two. And there are many established rituals, not least the pitch process, which contribute to this being very hard to avoid so that by the time the agency celebrates winning its new account, it's already bent over so far, it will never find a way to get up. If you think I exaggerate, I found a paragraph in Campaign two weeks ago about the pitch for you view, who have just fired the agency they appointed only six months ago. 
Long lists are being drawn up this week. A head of agency is being invited to give a 30-minute presentation to Lord Sugar, apprentice style. Well, this is one way of getting into the boardroom. And maybe like the apprentices, you'll do anything to get there. And just read the body language. I think the interesting aspiration for any, any agency today is to find more ways to enable better dialogue and collaboration with their clients. I don't think it's fundamentally impossible. I do think, however, it runs counter to a lot of deeply ingrained cultural practices on both sides, so it can be hard to achieve and harder to sustain. As I've said, the best people and the best teams have always found their own ways of doing this, and I'm sure they still do. It may be even that it's happening more today than in the past, but I have no evidence to support that. And the overwhelming experience I get from talking to people in agencies continues to be frustration, complaints of powerlessness, overwork and resentment. And it's far from clear to me that the quality or effectiveness of marketing communications have improved either since <coughs> the 70s or 80s. I would like to think there are better ways of working which could offer better outcomes more quickly for the advertisers and less frustration for all concerned. And I think these might depend on better collaboration, better dialogue, and the cultivation of mutual respect based on a clearer understanding of place, belonging, and exchange between the players. What worries me about debates about the present one, about status, is that they reinforce our attention on the wrong things, on the power struggles between the departments, or on measuring the success of a client relationship by how far up the hierarchy you can pretend to climb, or even on judging yourself against the past, which in advertising I find seems to be simultaneously constructed as a primitive land of leisure, but also as a golden age of creativity. Well, I was there, and in my view, it wasn't fundamentally that different from today. And you won't help yourself by using it to make excuses for your current difficulties. So I want to end with one word for you to meditate on, and that word is respect. Respect for your clients. You are there to serve them, which doesn't mean to obey their every instruction, but it does mean they're paying you to do something for them. And as Simon says, that does actually have quite a lot to do with selling stuff, usually. And it does mean you should listen to them with an open mind. Respect for each other in the agency. Acknowledge that planners, creative suits, whatever, you all need each other and you should value each other. Respect for the past. It's worth looking closely at what your predecessors said and did because they were actually facing the same basic questions as you do. They were pioneers every bit as much as you are, if not more, and they did somehow do a lot of good work. But lastly and most importantly, respect for yourself. Don't do your work bent over. To achieve that requires both courage and a high level of skill, but you can at least start by making it a clear intention. Don't judge yourselves by whether you get into that mythical boardroom or by who gets there most often. Judge yourself by whether you are creating the conditions for you and your clients to do the best job you can do together. Good luck. Good luck.